until it's time to record, and then I can flick it on. That way, you won't catch me saying something stupid uh, on uh, on the recording. At least, at least, I won't say it will keep me. It will it will minimize that risk. <laughs> uh, I, I could cons I could conceivably do that, but it just it would take too much time. You know, I mean, I post two classes a day. So to go through and go in, and these would be gigantic files, and to go in and edit it, unless I had a really good reason, um, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't do that. Uh, I actually did that one semester because they forgot to turn the recording off. So my class went for like, you know, the regulation hour, and then there was like five minutes of a blue screen. And I thought, well, I'm going to take that out. And then it's like, nah, it ain't worth it. People get the idea after about two or three minutes of silence and a blue screen that the class is done. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, last time we had an exercise where we, if memory serves, we did the calculation of how much a trip would cost based on certain parameters. Um, and, and I did it just again, uh, just as an exercise. Um, it's, it's certainly worthwhile to have lectures or I, I show you stuff, but it's also worthwhile for you to practice the stuff as well. So. Especially given the fact that our lab is available during class time. You know, I'll do that probably a few times throughout the semester where, where there'll be maybe partly a lecture or maybe all an activity or, or whatever. At any rate, uh, today what I'd like to do is I'd like to go over that. Because um, people made good progress on it, but, you know, we can certainly look at it and, and answer any questions that you might have and talk about it a bit. Now, we have three choices. I could either start, if you remember, we had, uh, when I did the, the other example, I put the code in the button, I put the code in the function, then I put the fo code in a class. So we could do one, two, or three. And we're going to end it up with it in the class. So if we do that one, that will be the only one I do. If we do two, I'll do two and three. If we do one, I'll do methods one, two, and three. Um, how many want me to start out at the beginning and do the code right on the button? Okay, one vote. Any other votes? How many want me to put the code as a function? All right, but not necessarily on the button. Okay. So, um, I'll actually, you know, uh, the, 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 the joke's on you. This actually isn't a democracy, so your vote didn't really count. Because <laughs> I'm going to do what I want. But no, that is good to get your feedback on this. What I'm going to do is, if, if everyone would have said jump to the class, I would have jumped to the class. But given that people still are a little uh, um, uh, iffy on the functions, I'll go back to putting it on the button, then we'll put it in a function, then we'll go in and put it in a class. Now, um, I did see one student, um, uh, Jim I think it was, um, actually pulled out some paper and did some figuring before the actual coding happened. And that was actually great. That was actually uh, great because that was one of the things I was going to emphasize is it never hurts to plan what you're going to do. And planning or designing in this sense really has two aspects. There is the, the user interface part of it, what you need on the user interface side, then what you need on the programming logic side. And one thing that we almost certainly will do, I don't know if we'll do it next time or sometime next week, is take a problem where one of you is responsible for the user interface and one of you is responsible for creating a class. Maybe we'll do a couple small ones like that and then you can switch off. But there's both, there's going to be that user interface component and then the, the processing component. And what we'll do first of all is we'll talk about the user interface component um, to, to plan ahead. Really the idea is, is if you plan ahead, the actual coding should be fairly easy. Should be, I don't want to say trivial, but the, the work is really figuring out what you need to do. Now, in this particular case, we said we wanted to um, allow the user to enter in the number of miles, enter in the kind of vehicle, and enter in 
the uh, type of gasoline. And we said something like this. The miles more than likely would be a text box. I suppose we could do a drop down and put a drop down with miles from zero to 200 or whatever we thought, but I don't know if you really gain anything by doing that. I would just as soon uh, type in the number of miles as opposed to scroll through a long drop down list and find, find that. So we'll, we'll, we'll use a text box for that. For type of vehicle, we, we said we had three choices. We had um, economy, standard, and luxury, I think. That's what we said. Something like that. And we said an economy, uh, standard car got 25 miles a gallon, economy got 35, luxury got 15. Finally then we said for type of gas there was premium, regular, and economy, where premium was 375, regular was 350, and 325. Something like that. All right. Um, Again, if the exact numbers are a little different, uh, I, I apologize, but that, that's my remembrance of it. Now, both the vehicle and the type of gasoline, we probably don't want to do a text box for, given the fact that we're going to limit them to certain choices. So really, either a drop down or a radio button would, would do us fine in this case, because in both of those, you can constrain the user to uh, only pick one of the allowable selections and not just freeform put something in. Um, we want to probably put validation in. Um, I will make our life easy, all right? And I will default the vehicle to standard and the type of gasoline to regular. Now, they can still pick the other two, but that will be the default. And if we do that, then we can't really validate that box, right? Because we don't know if they left it on there by mistake or if they wanted regular. So by putting a default in there, we can't really validate that. All right. Uh, so we won't have any validation for that. For this, we're going to put in a validation of a required field. And we might as well do a range validation of what well, we can put in um, that the, the value has to be a positive number. It has to be less than, I don't know, what's the longest car trip anyone's ever taken? I don't know, a couple thousand miles, 3,000? Uh, I just read about a guy that took a kayak across the, the Atlantic Ocean, this old Polish guy, all right? And he has, he has this long beard, and he's 60-some years old, and he took it. Now, he cheated a little bit. By cheated, I mean... He took the narrowest path across the Atlantic Ocean, which is from the edge of Africa to the edge of South America. But still, let's, let's look him up. Yeah, that is totally crazy. But, you know, good for him. You know, here I am. I take a, I take a break when I'm walking to the refrigerator. I say, what does this have to do with? Oh, this has to do with the longest car trip that we're going to enter in. Atlantic cross kayak. And here we go. There he is. On one of these pages, they showed a map of, yeah, here. So, how many miles is that? 3320. But still, you know, if he would have gone from, say, France to the United States, that would have been a lot, you know, I can't, these slackers, you know, take an easy way out, I'll tell you. All right. So I'll bet you there was someone one day that was doing an example like this except with kayaks and said, well, what's the longest kayak trip that you could take? Oh, a thousand miles. No one's ever going to go farther than that. But, well, I don't know. We'll make up some limit. The, totally yeah, right. <laughs> um, I'm jealous of the guy's beard, but, you know, <laughs> hey, what, what could I say? At any rate, we spend some time then thinking about the user interface. All right, what we're going to do, what we're going to put on, what are going to be the defaults. Again. Choose defaults if you think it's reasonable to have defaults, all right? 
don't choose defaults because that gets you out of validating stuff. All right. In other words, if you pick defaults, you really can't validate that drop down now. Um, that's not a good reason to choose something as a default. Pick a default if you think that that's the reasonable thing to do. Now, we are going to uh, spend a minute talking about the calculation because the calculation that we wanted to do is we wanted to calculate the total cost of the trip. Uh, the, the cost for gasoline, that is. And let's, let's sort of work our way backwards to how we're going to calculate that. All right. To calculate um, the cost of the trip, the cost of the trip is going to be equal to the rate per gallon, the, the price per gallon, let's say price per gallon, times how many gallons. Okay? So that's ultimately what we want to calculate in this. All right? So all we got to do is figure out what's the price and how many gallons do we need. Okay. What's the price? The price is going to be a, based on a series of if statements If gas type equals E, the price equals 325. If gas type equals standard, or uh, regular rather, the uh, price is going to be 350. Finally, if the gas type is uh, premium, the price is going to be 375. So that's how we figure out the price. Notice as I'm writing this, um, I'm not writing necessarily VB statements. I'm writing just things, that, you know, this is my brainstorming. This is my getting my thoughts down before I'm going to code. And, and this is a very valuable thing, and, and people don't do that. Um, people don't do that a lot anymore because it's so easy just to enter your program in, give it a twirl, and see if it works or not, right? Uh, one of these days when I'm feeling nostalgic, I'll go off probably for at least a half hour talking about how it was back when I used punch cards, all right? And you really had to think about what you were doing before you did it because you ran it today and you got it back tomorrow. So you couldn't afford a little mistake, all right? And if there was a good side to that, it was you got used to thinking through your code before you ran it, all right? And that, that I think, allowed folks to really get a good sense of how to develop uh, algorithms. And, and I'm not saying we ought to go back to that, but we should try to incorporate that thought process into our coding and take advantages of the old way of doing it with the new way of doing it as well. Isn't that called pseudocode? That could be called, yeah, this is called pseudocode, where it like, kind of looks like code, but it isn't really. The other choice that you could have is do flow charts with the diagrams and the diamonds and all that. That, in my mind, gets a little unwieldy once it gets too big. It's good to show maybe something simple, but beyond a certain point, that gets to be too big. Now, the other component of this is how many gallons. Well, how many gallons? The gallons are going to be the miles divided by the miles per gallon. All right? The miles we're getting from the text box, just like the gas type we're getting from the drop-down, where are we going to get the miles per gallon? Well, we're going to have a similar thing. If car type equals economy, then miles per gallon equals 35, and so on down the line. So we spend a few minutes thinking through this before we actually jump in and start coding. All right? In fact, when we get to coding, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put my comments in first. All right? Because I could actually write out my comments now, even if I don't know the language. Let's write them out now and we'll come back to them. I'm going to get the miles. Get miles per gallon. Calculate gallons. Get price per gallon. And then finally calculate cost. That's really the steps. 
that we're going to do. And notice again, I didn't write any code there, but this could be the comments of my code when I go to put that in. All right. Um, colleague I worked with said that's the best thing to do is write your comments first. And there's two good reasons for writing your comments first. What do you suppose the two good reasons are? I'll give you one of the good reasons. One of the good reasons uh, is that it gives you a way of planning your code before you do it. What do you suppose the other reason is? Maintain. Well, maintainability, right? Uh, indirectly, yeah. It's good to have comments, and if you do like most software developers do, you're going to say, well, I'm going to get this code to work, then I'll go back and comment it. No one in history has ever gone back and commented it. It has never happened. All right. Therefore, you need to put the comments in as you're writing it. Otherwise, it's very unlikely that you're going to go in. The other thing I would say is, you know, when you're doing this, comment it in a way that you're explaining what you're doing and not explaining just the syntax of the language. For example, you know, if I have a statement that's like, M equals document, oh document, geez, I'm in JavaScript, um, text box one dot text. Don't say set the variable M to the value of the text property of the text box. That doesn't tell you what you're doing. That's explaining the syntax of that statement. That's not explaining the meaning or the semantics of that statement. Why are you doing that? What are you doing? Well, you're getting the miles from the form. All right, so write your comments not from the perspective of explaining the syntax of the language, but from the perspective of explaining what you're doing it for. All right, so I think we've done enough planning, we've done enough talking, and let's jump in and, and write the code. I forgot to start up Visual Studio. Which means that if you're in good shape, you'll have a chance to kayak across the Atlantic before it comes up. So what we're going to do again is we're going to build this, this uh, one step at a time. Again, we're going, to, we're going to put the code on the button, we're going to move the button, uh, the, the code that's on the button to a function, and then lastly we're going to put it in a custom class. All right, so let's go in and Create an empty website. Tell you what, we'll live it up. And we'll, we'll create a website. We won't create an empty website. I wanted to kind of to talk to you about this anyhow at some point. So now's as good a time as any. So I'm going to create a website. And I'm going to go create it on the desktop. And I will call it Trip Calculator. Trip Calculator. Now, what this is going to do for us is this is going to give us more stuff already. You know, uh, more stuff for free, more stuff initially when it creates the application. When we created an empty website, all we got was our folder and the global file. Uh, I'm sorry, not the global file, the web config file. With this one, we get more, fi uh, more files. We get a couple of folders. Uh, an account folder where we can put like login information of who can log in, an app data where we can put our database and data sources, a scripts folder where we can put our classes, um, a styles folder where we can put our styles, and it gives us a couple of pages for free. It gives us an, a, a default page and an about page. It also gives us a master page. Okay, now. The idea of a master page is we can take a portion of our code, a portion of our web page that's going to be common on every web page, 
And instead of coding that on every individual page, we code it on the master page. All right. So I'm going to go into this master page, and I can look at it again either in design view or in source view. And I can go in and I can change the section of the code that's common, that's going to be common on every page. So let's say this is, you know, Zeller's car rental. I can put that banner on the top of the page and I could put an image of a car or I could put something like that. And I'm putting it in the master page. And what that means is every page that I create is going to like inherit from that master page. So if I want something on every single page like navigation or like banners or like a footer or any sort of thing like that, I can put that on the master page and every page will get it. All right? It's almost like uh, in HTML where you create a separate CSS file. All right? The only difference is, is this is for our HTML code. So. With that in mind, we're going to go into my default page. And my default page, this part that's outside of that purple outline comes from the master page. And if you notice, I can't edit that because that comes from the master page. If I want to edit that, I have to go and edit the master page. What I can edit is the stuff that's inside of here. All right. And so I can go delete all this stuff. And I can start adding my visual components. I can add a label, a text box, a drop down. another drop down and a button. All right, for label I can type in miles. And I'm going to go for good measure and I'm going to change the the idea of that text box to txt miles. I didn't necessarily worry about changing the the idea of that label cuz I'm I'm not really programming that, right? I'm not going to ever dynamically change that miles to something else. Now, in some cases, I might want to do that, right? What if I was doing a site like this in Canada, where the user could choose whether they wanted English or French instructions? I could programmatically set those labels to something else if they chose French versus uh, English. All right. This one I'm going to call drop down car. And this one I'll call DD gas. Oops. And this one we'll call button submit. And I will set the text of this to say go ahead and calculate. Now, I'm going to go in, I'm going to hard code these three car types in. So I'm going to go into the drop down and select edit items. And I'll add my three items. The first one being for um, this is car type. So the first one is economy, which I'm giving a value of E2, standard, which is S, and luxury, which is L. Now I mentioned I wanted standard to be defaulted, so I can choose the selected option and set that equal to true. That will default it to that option. Um, I probably won't go doing any, any validation at all until the end, because I think we have a grip on the, on, uh, on the validation. So we'll just play nice and make sure we only enter in valid data uh, in this one. I'll do the same thing for the gas type. And for 
for that I had economy E regular R and premium. Now, a bit of foreshadowing here. It's very likely that these values won't be hard coded in that drop down. We're doing that now because this is the point of the class that we're in. Those values will likely come from a database. In other words, there'll be a database that will say these are the valid uh, car types. These are the valid uh, gas types. So for now, we're hard coding them in. Uh, but again, going forward, there's likely to be uh, values that come from the database. All right. So we're ready to go. I can go then whoops, and get in and I can write code for the button click event. Now, as I said before, even though there's no validation that I put in, I might put validation in and as such I'm going to surround the code with an if is valid. What that will do is that will prevent the code from being executed if um, client side scripting is disabled and there's a validation error. All right. So I'll put a comment in that describes that only do calculation if no validation errors. Again, and I'm, I'm talking about the meaning of that statement. I'm not saying if the value of is valid is true, then do that. Anyone that knows VB knows that that's what that does. I'm going to go in and I'm going to put my other comments in. Get miles. Get MPG. Calculate gallons. Get price per gallon. calculate cost and finally display cost and I suppose I need a label for that. Let me go and put a label here. All right. So, yeah, go ahead. Um, I saw that you just used an ASP label mm -hmm. for accessibility. Which one should we use? ASP or the HTML? The HTML label is used for accessibility when you are um, putting a label for a form field. Oh. So, um, this last one I did, the results, is not a label for a form field. So, I can use the ASP label for that. Now, where I said miles, that probably should be in an in HTML label because for accessibility I should do this. I should go in to here in the source and not have an ASP.NET label but instead have a label for txt miles. So, if I was doing it proper, that would be the one that I'd make an HTML label because that's the one that's associated with a, um, with a form control. Good question. Yes? Does git enter in HTML usually when you debug it? Will it be You can, you can actually turn any HTML control into a uh, ASP.NET control by simply saying run at equals server. Now I'd have to see specifically what, what you would did in your, in, in your case. Um, yeah, like whatever classes I had 
Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Interesting. All right. So now let's go and do this. Get miles. Let's dim some variables up here. Dim miles as double. Dim gallons as double. Dim MPG as double. Dim price as double. And last but not least, dim total as double. All right, so we've dimmed all our variables. And let's go and let's do these things. Now again, if I've done a, a, a decent job with this, then writing a code should be a lot easier. Get the miles. What is the expression for that? It would just be miles equals txt miles dot text. All right. Get miles per gallon. We know that is based on the car type, right? So I can say if, where's the car type going to be? It's going to be in the drop down that I call DD car. What attribute do I want from that? Pardon me? Yeah, what attribute do I want from the drop down? Selected value, right. You actually have three choices. The selected index is the position of the element that you picked. In other words, if you pick the first item in the drop down, that'll be a zero. If, you, if it's the second item, it'll be a one. The selected item actually will be an item object. So it will have properties itself. The selected value is the actual value of the selected item. So. Probably the easiest thing to do is say if the selected value of the type of car equals E, then MPG equals 35. And I could write another comment that says economy cars get 35 MPG. Now I'm going to duplicate this and I'm just going to type dot 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 indicating you'd put a real comment there. If it is a standard car, we said 25 miles an hour. If it is a luxury car, we said 15 miles per gallon. Now, you could definitely write this other ways. You could write this with else statements. All right. You could write this with a case statement. All right. You know what? I don't care. Um, this is not, you know, uh, this is not 1965, and we're writing assembly language routines, and we're trying to scrape every ounce of efficiency out of the CPU. Right? You could probably write this code more concisely. Maybe write this code a little more efficiently. But you know what? In I was going to say, what, what year? 2012? Really what is a premium is that the code is understandable so that you can go and change it. The difference in the efficiency is, is negligible compared to the fact that write it in the way that is easiest for you to understand. So for example, in this case, every time through it's going to do these three if statements. So if I wrote else's, I wouldn't have to do that. You know? So what? That's my take on it. So what? Slightly less efficient. If that does it for you and that makes it easier to understand, it's worth it to do it that way. Likewise with a case. A case can make the code cleaner and all that. That is if you understand how to write that statement. If you don't understand how to write it, then it's going to make it harder. All right? So that's my take on it. I don't know. Uh, I don't know like what NORAD teaches as far as that goes. Does NORAD necessarily go for every little piece of efficiency you can get to or, or what. There's the value for different things. That, that's my particular take on it. Make it readable. Yeah, make it readable is usually my, 
my answer. Now, there are, there are times when some things are clearly way more inefficient, in which case, yeah, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not advocating inefficiency. I am advocating um, that there are other things important besides efficiency. Okay, so now we have the MPG and we can calculate the miles. And from our pseudocode, remember the miles are going to, or I'm sorry, the gallons are going to be equal to the miles divided by the MPG. All right. Get price per gallon. We're going to have a similar series of if statements. If DD, what's that, gas? Selected value equals what I have. Economy, so E, the price equals three twenty Three fifty, three seventy five. And then finally, calculate the cost. How do we calculate cost? Again, I have that in my pseudocode. The total cost is simply um, price times gallons. And then I want to display the, the answer. So I can say TXT, I'm sorry, L B L results dot text equals price for trip is Let's run this and, and make sure that it works. I'm going to go in and, and, and pick, something, pick something easy. I probably should move the mouse or say something so in the control room they don't think that the <laughs> recording device had frozen. All right. Notice a couple things. Notice our page has that header on it. Notice that the other page, the about page that we haven't done anything on it, also has the same look and feel. So that's a nice thing. We will talk about these master pages in more detail, but really a, a big benefit as far as maintainability, right? Again, we're taking something and separating it and putting it so that if we have to change it, we only change it in one place. So again, it's sort of an inspired laziness. Yes? Is it automatically put your body into the div then? When you create your individual pages, we'll see exactly. What it does is there's a content placeholder. I forget the name of the exact um, tags. There's a content placeholder, and then there's a content area. And the content placeholder is on the master page, and it says, I'm going to want something here. And then when you clone that page and create a page from the master page, you say, here's a content area that's going to fill in that placeholder on the master page. All right. 
So let's say we want to go 100 miles. We'll make the math easy. Let's say we have a standard automobile which gets 25 miles per gallon, which means that it will cost, it will be four gallons, all right? Four gallons at regular would be four times 350 or $14. And sure enough, $14. Let's do 150 miles in a luxury car, which gets 15 miles a gallon, so that would be 10 uh, gallons. And let's buy, if we're driving a luxury car, of course we're going to drive, get premium gas, right? And that's 375, so that should be like 37.50. And sure enough, um, ideally, if we were testing this, we'd test all the combinations. And in this case, it'd be like nine combinations that would test. Plus, we might test some validation things if if we put validation stuff in here. All right, that is. We figure out the logic. What's not good about this is this is, is tightly coupled to the page. It's really tethered to the page. It's tightly coupled, which means that we couldn't use this anywhere else, even anywhere else on this page. So what we want to do is we want to break this out into a function where we're going to give it some parameters and we're going to get the result. Now remember, a function can take multiple parameters. A function can only return one value. All right. In this particular case, what are the ingredients? What does the function going to need to know in order to do its thing and calculate it? Again, I'll move around so they don't think the recording is stopped. What does a function need to know to calculate the cost of the trip? The parameters. Yeah, the parameters. And, and what are those parameters? Five Pardon me? Five variables. Does it need to know those five variables or will it calculate some of those variables? Okay, but what, what things are going to be the arguments? What are going to be the arguments to our function? Price of gas? Okay. Right. The, the, the arguments that we're going to use in this function are the number of miles, that's a given, right? The type of car that will allow us to calculate the miles per gallon, and the type of gasoline that they want to buy. Remember, our goal ultimately is we're going to encapsulate all the knowledge about this process in a class. First we're going to put it all in a function, then we're going to put it in a function within a class. So therefore, if I passed this function, the number of miles per gallon that the car got, this user interface code would have to know something about cars and know how many miles per gallon these different cars get. All right. The user interface, we want to be dumb. All right. We want it to simply glue together the stuff that's going to be on the screen with our business logic and our processing. So if we build in, for example, the fact that a economy car gets 35 miles a gallon and so on, and that economy gas is 325, regular is 350, we would be putting some business logic in the user interface class. And that's not good. All right. What's the user interface know? The user interface knows how many miles they're, they're, the trip is, what kind of car they're driving, and what kind of gas they're getting. So that's what it's going to give to the function. So I'm going to go here, and I'm going to create a function. Let me stop the debug. I'm going to create a function. Yeah, you should be able to see it. We're going to create a function. One of these days when I'm in a bad mood, it's going to be like, no, <laughs> figure it out. Public function, calculate trip cost. And we're going to define the arguments. So one of the arguments we're going to have is we're going to have 
arg miles as double arg car type as string and finally arg gas type as string. So we define the arguments and we define the type for each argument. Now when we call this function we just have to make sure we get it in the right order. All right, that the first argument is the miles that we provide it. The second argument is the type of car and the third argument is the type of gas. That's the responsibility of whoever's calling the function. Remember, whoever calls the function is responsible for getting the input together, formatting the input if anything needs to be done, and calling the function with the proper arguments in the proper place. Now, that is the arguments. We also have to specify the type of the return value. And the type of the return value is going to be a double. Because that's what this function is going to return. All right. We're going to give it that ingredient, so we're going to get back a double. We're going to get back a number. So, now I can go and I can actually move a good portion of this code grab all that and I'm going to put that in here. All right. Now, what am I going to do? Well, I can replace wherever it says txt miles with the argument for miles. I can replace dd car selected value with our car type. and so on. What am I doing in essence? In essence I'm removing anything in this function that looks outside of itself to the surrounding page. Um, decoupling it. I'm de-untethering it. All right. So there's nothing here that's going to refer to anything on the outside page. Because once I do that I'm in a position to take this code and put it in its own class. All right. And because it's not associated with any specific user interface. It just, everything it needs, it gets as an argument, does its thing, it might have some internal variables, like the, the conditions to see what the price of premium gas is and all that, and then it's going to return the result. So, I have question. go ahead. <laughs> just to make it kind of complicated. Huh? No. That's going to be, all right, because look at it this way. Let's say, let's say we have, uh, the question is, is, is here we're hard coding the, the, the price of gasoline at a certain rate. Well, as we all know, the price of gas is really volatile. All right. So the question is, is in a real application, where would we get that uh, value for the, 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 the price of gas? We still wouldn't want to get it in the user interface, right? Because we could have a number of different pages that all calculate the trip cost, which means that we'd have to change that logic in a couple different places. We would still then would put that knowledge in the class. Now that class may run out to a database. That class may call another a web service. That class may do a whole bunch of other things. But the point is, is that calculation and that process will be encapsulated within this one class, within this one place. So the user interface will still, it won't give me, give the function a price, it will still say, hey, they want economy gas, they want premium gas, they want regular gas. And it will be then that class's responsibility to actually go and get the price the right way, as opposed to having it hard coded. So that's a good, good question. Again, keep in mind we want to keep our user interfaces dumb. We don't want to put a lot of what I would call business logic in this. All right. Um, there's also, again, the notion of encapsulation. Whereas everything about a certain business logic, business process, whatever you want to call it, is embedded within a class. All right. So figuring out how much gas costs 
will be embedded in some class somewhere. In our case, it would be embedded in this class. There actually could be a gasoline pump class that maybe it would be embedded in that. All right. Great question. Gas. All right. So now I think I've gone through and I've substituted. Essentially, all I'm doing here is I'm substituting the form controls. Or actually, I'm, sub I'm substituting the arguments for the form controls. I'm taking out the form controls because I don't want this logic looking at the details of the form. I want everything that this function uses to come in as an argument. So instead of looking at the form, I'm looking at the arguments. And then when I'm done, I need to return the total. All right. So we've defined this function and at a glance, it looks like it's complete. We'll find that out, right? Now I want to go in and I want to actually do the calling of the function. So I'm going to dim a variable called answer as double. This is going to be the answer. And I'm going to say answer equals, and I'm going to put the name of my function, which was calculate trip cost. And then I have to supply the arguments in order. All right. This will be the code that looks to the form, right? It's okay to have this look at the form because this is just sort of your glue code, right? This is a code that's sort of gluing together your user interface with your business logic, all right? So there, you know, something has to know where these miles are coming from. That's this code, all right? So this code is going to be the code that actually connects, you know, be the connector that connects the uh, the, 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 the code behind here with our business logic. So where are we getting that from? We're getting that from the text box miles. Where are we getting the car type? DD car dot selected value. And then finally where are we getting the kind of gas from DD gas dot selected value. And we're putting the result in answer. All right. So then I'm going to format currency answer. I deliberately changed it from answer, from total to answer, to show you again. Remember, this variable total was declared inside this function, so it can only be seen inside that function. It only has scope inside that function. All right. So outside of that function. I can't access the variable total. What this statement says is whatever this function returns, whatever value it returns, take it and stuff that value in the variable called answer. And then I can go and do what I need to with answer, in this case format uh, currency and display a message that says price for the trip. Question. All right. Right now, this returns a double, which is the, the amount of the, the total. Could I, well, the answer to could I is almost always yes, you could. All right. Would I want to have the function return the message, price for the trip is format currency? Would I want to do that in the function, the formatting as currency and concatenating a string in front of it? Would I want to do that in the function? No. Why not? Because what if you're calculating it for something else? E exactly. Yeah, else. Exactly. Uh, in other words, <laughs> the other responsibility that the calling function has is to take the result, take the return value, and do what it needs to do with it. So in this case, the total cost of the trip is a number. Now. We could do a lot of things with that number. This could be included on a page that takes the cost of the gas and adds to it the cost for meals, the cost for a hotel room, the cost for 
miscellaneous expenses and comes up with a total, total cost for the trip. So maybe in another case, this answer isn't the final answer, but just an ingredient in the total answer. Or maybe we want to change the verbiage. We don't want to say price for this trip is. We want to, again, if, they're in, uh, if they want to see the answer in French, they'll say it in French. If we want it in English, they'll say it in English. So we let whoever calls the function decide what to do with the answer. The function's job is simply to take the arguments, do its thing, and return the answer. A good function will only refer to the things that are given to it as arguments and the stuff that is declared inside of it. It won't look at anything else in sort of the surrounding area, like text boxes or labels or anything like that. By the same token, we wouldn't want this function to take this and insert that total amount in the label, all right, for the same reason. There might be another occasion where we're going to call this function where we're not going to take that result and put it in the label, but do something else with it. Let's make sure this works. And I will go in and say 150 miles with a luxury car, that's 10 gallons, with economy gas, that should be 3250. And sure enough, it is. All right. I won't do any of the other tests because I believe I probably did everything right. Um, I guess we'll see, you know, if, if there's a mistake at some point. Now you see we have the function written, so it's not really tethered to the page, yet it still lives on the page. All right, so it's like we did half the job. We started out with code that worked, but that was part of the button, and that drastically limited the flexibility. Now we have code that's a little more flexible, but it's still not as flexible as it could be. And now our job is to go in and take that code and put it as part of a custom class. So that's what I'm going to do. Again, this could be done other ways, uh, or, or several ways. I'm going to do it just one pretty straightforward way. I'll go in here and I'll create my class. And I'll give the class a descriptive name. I'll call it trip. Add. Okay, my mistake, it's not, it doesn't want to put it in the scripts folder, it wants to put it in the app code folder, so I'll say yeah. And it'll put it there. And now I have my code for my class that I could put any number of things. Alright? In this case, what I'm going to put in there is I'm going to put my function in. So I'm going to calculate this and I'm going to put it in my function. Now the nice thing is, if I did step two correctly, I just have to cut and paste, right? Because part of step two was eliminate any reference in that function to something outside of the function, something that was elsewhere on the page. So I shouldn't get any little blue squiggly lines when I copy and paste it, because this function, if I did it right, is self-contained. Everything it needs is either inside the function or is passed to it as an argument. And then it returns the answer when it's done. Well, if we look, sure enough, no blue squiggly line, so we must have did that right. Now, to sort of finish things up, the last step I have to do is I have to then now that I've gotten rid of that function from inside this page, I have to tell, th this page has to know where to find the function. We move the function, we, we put it somewhere else. And so what we're going to do is we're going to create an object of that class. So I can dim t as new, and I call it trip. All right. Then I can say t dot calculate trip cost. 
The reason we have to do that is we could have um, several different calculate total cost functions. We could have the calculate total cost function for hotels. We could have it for meals. We could have it for airplane trips instead of automobile trips, um, kayak trips, whatever. We could have several different calculate trip cost functions. So we have to say which one we want to use. And we want to use the one that is found in the class trip. So we create an object of that type and then say we want to go and call the function on that object. And now we should be completely set. And we go in and put 150 luxury regular should be $35. And it is. Now we can go in and we can put another user interface on our page, on a, on a different page. Let's go to that about page. I can go and put a drop down here. Mm -hmm. I have a sure. Um, do you have to actually create an object, or do you just like import the class or attach the class? I think it's you, you, uh, you would have to create an object unless you made the function a static function. Okay. Uh, a static function is a function that doesn't require an instance of the object to call it. Oh, and I fear I probably picked the wrong dialog anyhow. Alrighty. For the next 10 minutes, I'll do hand shadows to show you what it would have looked like had I gone in and do that. The point is, is now that we have that code isolated, we could call it anywhere in our application. And it doesn't matter if the interface looks the same or not. All right. I could, for example, get the miles from a drop down. Right? Okay. Yeah, that was the wrong one. All that just to hit cancel. Um, so I could go in and Does anyone know off the top of their head where to get uh, Windows? Yeah. Probably it was either under Window or the Toolbar box. Yeah. Hit View. Oh, okay, there you go. Thank you. View. There we go. All right, there we go. And I could go and dra drag a drop down over and a label 
we'll just do this real quick. And I could define, you know, three predefined trip ten mile trip, a twenty mile trip, and a thirty mile trip. All right. I'm going to make this auto post back. What that means is as soon as I change the value, it will go ahead and do the calculation. All right. I'll go put my label for the results. Then I will write not on the click event, but the selected item changed event, which is a server side event. And this code will only work if I've clicked the auto post back. What the auto post back says is when I change the value, send it to the server as though I clicked the submit button. So now what I can do is I can dim T1 as trip as new trip dim cost as double cost equals t1 dot calculate trip cost, I can get from drop down list one selected value, the elected value or selected value, the miles, and for the other two, since I don't have values, I could maybe just use defaults. This is going to assume that I'm picking using a regular car and regular gas. So I can say what were the things um, Standard car, right? So I said standard for car and regular gas. I think that's what I said. And then I can go and say LBL results equal cost. Oh, LBL results dot text equals cost. Now when I go and run this, I now I'm sharing the code between two places. Um, everything about the calculation, the determination of the miles per gallon, the determination of the price of gas, the formulas for doing that calculation is encapsulated inside that class. And these classes, or I'm sorry, these two pages, all they do really is they prepare the arguments, call the function, and display the results. So a 10 mile trip, I assume that answer is correct. A 10 mile trip with a standard car, that would be 40, that would be 0.4 gallons, 0.4 times 350 is $1.40. So yeah, I did that one correct. I assume the rest of them work as well. All right. So now if something changes, you know, let's say, you know, instead of hard coding it, we've hard coded it on the first version just to get a rough idea of it. We now get uh, from um, Shell Oil a web service that we can use to get the actual price of gas, all right, instead of just our approximate, you know, uh, value. I can just go in and change that class to use that web service. And I don't have to touch any of the user interface because none of that logic lives in the user interface. The user interfaces are dumb. All they do is grab the values that the function needs, call the function, grab the results, and do something with it. All right. Questions about any of this? I have a Sure, yeah. 
Absolutely. But there are people like saying this stuff, right? Because they're, they're different pages, right. And, and, and for one thing, that th those other variables, they only have scope within that function. And, and again, and it's on a different page, so it's not like those two would be competing at all. Um, truth be told, I have no idea why I typed in T1 as the name of the variable. Um, just, just to do it, I suppose. Um, but yeah, there, there's no relation for that. They're, they're independent. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. We could even write code, if you wanted to, to like generate a chart. All right. We could write a loop that ran a trip through maybe 10 through 1,000 miles, called the function once with economy car and economy gas. Called the net, you know, and have so that we had nine columns, one for each combination of car and gas type, and produce a chart. All right, simply by calling that function over and over and over again and passing it different arguments. Because all the knowledge about doing that calculation is in one place. And all we have to do now is provide it with the arguments that it needs, call it, and then do whatever we need to do with the result. All right, next time we're going to talk more about master pages. We, we introduced them today. Uh, we got maybe a little sense of, of their capabilities. Um, the benefit, again, is, is to make a change in one place, and it reflects uh, universally. We'll talk more about those, and we'll talk about other things that we can do to add maintainability to the user interface side of things. What we talked about in the last couple of lectures, last two or three lectures, was taking and adding reusability to our logic, to our code. Now we're going to do a similar thing to our UI stuff, our user interface, the look and feel of our sites. All right. See you in lab.